and just sensing into what's here, what's alive for you in this moment. Maybe that sensations in the body. Maybe it's the mind moving quickly, thinking about things from the day, what's coming up in this session. I'm just taking this opening practice to take an internal weather report and see what's here. And to help support us arrive most fully into this moment, let's bring the awareness in through the body and all the way down to where we may be feeling points of contact with support beneath us. Sensing into the stability rising up to meet the body. And we don't even need to do anything to receive that support, just be here, noticing. If you like to work with visualization, perhaps imagining roots dropping down from the body, anchoring into the ground beneath you. And the visualization's not your thing, just resting with what it feels like to be making contact with the ground. And as we rest our attention here at the ground, widening the awareness to all those that have walked this ground before you. And calling to mind that there have been many beings on this ground. Their sacrifices, their struggles, their joys, all here is part of the land that you're on. And taking a moment to recognize and acknowledge that. And also sensing into this connection that we have, even though that we're physically separate, in some cases thousands of miles apart, we're all resting on the same ground. So here we are together, sharing this earth gathered in this container online. And now bringing the awareness to what it is that brought you here tonight. Just allowing thoughts or words to arise in your awareness of what your goals for this session are, what it is that brought you here. And checking in with your motivation, the why. Why are you here? Why are you seeking those goals? Again, it can be as simple as a word or a statement, but anchoring into arriving into this moment by sensing into our motivations, And now finally arriving at how we would like to navigate this experience of this sitting tonight. Perhaps an attitude that we wish to embody or cultivate through the experience. And let this how be your intention for the evening. 
So cultivating perhaps a single word to describe how you would like to approach this evening. And as we come to an end of this short practice, perhaps returning back to open eyes if you've had them closed. And the invitation is to introduce yourself here in the chat, uh, maybe include where you're calling in from. And if it feels comfortable, maybe just a word to describe your intention of how you would seek to navigate tonight. And so for those of you that have joined while we were in that opening practice, welcome. Uh, we're just adding uh, our name, where we're calling from, and our intention for the night into the chat. Thank you, Tig. It's such a delight to be here with you um, virtually. And we are... Um, together, so happy to be here with you all. It's been um, just a wonderful opportunity for us as spiritual friends and Dharma brothers and sisters to really think about what we would like to offer to you this evening. So I'm Eve Ekman, joined by Tig O'Malley from the East Coast. So he's staying up late there with Katie. So we have some folks, yep, on the <laughs> night shift. Thank you for being present and showing up. And before we get started, I'm going to kind of follow this beautiful invitation uh, that Tig gave us of really considering our intention and our motivation for being here. And maybe like a lot of you, um, I am familiar with the text of the Dharma, this idea of intention, and yet it shows up in a fresh way all the time. And I think in this moment when a lot of our everyday relative reality feels very similar, maybe terribly similar, our intentions can create the freshness and really connecting to them. That's like a replenishment. I was really struck when you were guiding us to in this idea of sharing the same ground and mm -hmm. connected online. And I don't often think of the term internet. Um, and yet it came to mind that we are this beautiful net interconnected across the world. So maybe, maybe we should bring back that term and have it as another way to really forge our connection. So I think I can share with you all this one screen here, only one screen, I swear, this is not gonna be a, a long presentation, but I wanna invite you to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, which is a volunteer run organization where one of the primary values we hold is to make and create an intention for this space that everybody can show up and feel welcomed. Uh, we can't ensure what someone's experience is, but we think that these principles will help guide us and really help us remember what are we doing here tonight? Did we show up in order to have something that we're listening to while we're maybe walking around and doing other things in our home? Um, did we show up with really an aspiration for the teachings and the practice? So my invitation to you all this evening is, to really apply these paramitas, these spiritual qualities to our time together. And that includes at the very beginning, this idea of discipline. Um, and here, the way I'm including uh, discipline has to do with our, our posture, how we are showing up. You are totally welcome to lay down. I invite you to even um, put the camera a little bit up so you don't have to look at the screen. You can totally join by audio. And yet it is helpful to have the camera on you, maybe by side view, if you don't wanna look at the screen, because it really does help us feel as though we're in that space together where there are others here and we're holding that together. If you want to or need to have your camera off for a whole variety of reasons, many of us are living in homes with a lot of other people and situations occurring, no problem. If it's possible for you to show up with really having a presence that we can all enjoy together, I, I encourage that. The second paramita here is a generosity. And this is a generosity of really giving ourselves the time to show up fully. Overlapping with that discipline of our posture, this is the generosity of not allowing yourself to give in to the many pulls to your attention when you're sitting in front of your computer or phone. 
So the texts, the searches, the emails, all the other things that you could be doing, allow them to wait, give yourself the full spaciousness of being here. Um, this idea of non-harming, it's, it's the most quintessential intention I would like us all to hold in mind. This is how can we be non-harming to one another and to ourselves, right? When we are listening to these teachings and ideas and sharing our aspirations for bodhicitta, as we will tonight, to really hold yourself gently, your expectations or what you imagine other people are doing or not doing. Um, and so use this as a practice in your non-harming goals and um, kind of path forward. Patience, this is a really big one. We have been pretty fortunate in the Serpsco Dharma Collective to not have too many massive internet issues, but they can arise at any time. And so please have patience. If uh, accidentally somebody unmutes themselves, if one of the teacher's internet goes out, these things we just, you know, it's such a, uh, a difficult um, context for us all to be managing these days in this, in this setting. And, Though we really can't call it new anymore, um, I don't think it's quite yet familiar. I'm not willing to go that far. So let's have patience with ourselves and with others in this format. And most importantly, really take a moment to connect to your joyful enthusiasm. It is so awesome we get to be here together. We get to be here with these teachings. We get to be showing up as a community. Uh, maybe like some of you here, the relevance and value of these practices has never been more apparent to me, never been more apparent. And I find myself truly, joyfully looking forward to our time here in community together, my time to practice and my time to refine and, and get clear on these teachings time and time again. So that joyful enthusiasm, I really invite that. It doesn't have to be, though it's very important, it doesn't have to be serious. So I really invite that for you all. Thank you everybody who's sharing in the chat your intentions as well. Okay, so we're going to really move ourselves towards the next part of our evening. As many of you know, we have been covering this book, Open Heart, Open Mind by this lovely being, Sokni Rinpoche. And we will continue on this chapter about our essential Buddha nature really focusing tonight on bodhicitta. Yay! It's like the best part of any teaching, and that's what we're going to focus on the whole time. So really, really looking forward to sharing these ideas with you all. Tig will lead us in a meditation and talk about some aspects of bodhicitta. Then we will have some reflections for you. I will then take over and also reflect on some different aspects of bodhicitta, and we'll have time for... Um, some other questions and prompts at the end as well. So thank you, Eve. Uh, I wanted to point out while, while Eve was uh, taking us through that, um, it just took a look at where everyone's calling from. And so we have uh, San Francisco Bay Area all over the Bay, Massachusetts, New Jersey, I'm in Connecticut, um, and we also have uh, people joining from Australia and Israel. So we have the dinner shift, the night shift, and the breakfast shift. <laughs> so truly a global sangha tonight. And it's really a privilege and an honor to be able to share this space and uh, really take the time to come inwards and develop this, this sense of bodhicitta and um, support each other through that. So welcome to everyone. Um, so as Eve mentioned that, uh, the Sangha has been following the book, Open, Open Heart, Open Mind. And, um, one of the premises of this book and the teachings is how our patterns are so deeply ingrained. Uh, they're so carved that we begin to identify with them. And so these can be patterns of fear, stress, any type of suffering that we may start identifying as them and uh, it cuts us off from realizing our true Buddha nature and our potential. Um, and I like uh, how Rinpoche phrases this, how we identify is the glue 
that hold these patterns together. So tonight we're going to be practicing loosening up some of that glue, uh, perhaps creating some new patterns um, from a place of compassion, kindness, and awareness. So uh, as Eve mentioned, we're going to have a series of uh, investigative practice and then some reflection and really check in with our own practice of the Dharma and gain a better understanding of where we may be. Um, and so to support that, we're going to start tonight with a practice that many of you may be familiar with called Tonglen. Uh, and it is in you know, most of the teachings, it is the path to cultivating bodhicitta. Uh, so Tonglen is a taking and a giving or an extending and a receiving. Um, in the traditional practices, it's visualizing the suffering of others and then inhaling it and transmuting it and then returning it back to them as uh, light or metta energy. Uh, so it is a highly aspirational practice. Uh, it is a means of interrupting our own patterns um, and really training the mind to tap into this through a felt experience of um, cultivating compassion. <clears throat> um, so tonight I'm going to guide us through a variation of Tonglen. So it might be different than what you may be normal, uh, used to normally. Uh, so the invitation with that is to bring an open mind. Um, I'm going to offer a lot of different variations. Uh, there's gonna be visualization offered, there will be some phrases. So really just um, take care of yourself and do what feels right. Uh, if a visualization is not available for you, not a problem. Uh, there'll be some other options for you. And as the majority of this practice is really grounded in the breath, it's important to note that your breathing pattern may be different. Uh, well, it is different from mine. <laughs> so you, the way that I may be guiding and cueing where an inhale or an exhale is may be different from you, and that's fine. You're not doing it wrong. Uh, if you're not completely synced up with uh, my cues. So, um, as I said, take care of yourself, go with what feels right. And we'll have some time at the end of the practice to also open it up for some Q&A. So if anything comes up, we'll be able to spend some time with it. So with that, I'd like to invite you back into a comfortable posture, as Eve said, you can be seated, you can lay down, you can stand up, feel free to shift postures during the practice if that's supportive for you. As many of you heard me say, this is not meditation boot camp. So really bringing the sense of relaxation to both the body and the mind. <clears throat> so, so settling into whatever posture you have chosen. And just allowing the body to come to stillness. And however you are seated or laying down, invitation for this practice is to have the palms facing up towards the ceiling if that feels comfortable for you. And let's return to the anchor of the breath. So just gently resting the attention on the sensations of the air flowing in and out of the body. Noticing where you feel into this breath most vividly. And without manipulating the breath to be a certain way, just maintaining your natural breathing rhythm, beginning to sense into if there's any movement in the chest or the abdomen. And bringing a sense of curiosity here. Perhaps there's a sense of expansion on the inhale, relaxing on the exhale.
noticing perhaps already the mind moving away from the breath and getting lost in thoughts or other sensations in the body. And we'll be using mindfulness in this practice as a tool. So when you notice that the mind has drifted away, just gently and compassionately noticing and choosing to return back to wherever we are in the practice. invitation now is to continue focusing on the breath, but now using the visualization as if you could breathe directly into the heart center. And perhaps that same sense of expansion on the inhale is noticeable in the heart, the energy of the heart center, filling and expanding on the inhale relaxing and releasing on the exhale. And with our attention gently resting here in the heart, beginning to call to mind two or three positive things that are happening in your experience right now. Aspects that are supportive that you can feel into. Maybe it's a sense of gratitude or appreciation for being gathered in the Sangha. Perhaps a sense of thankfulness for certain material things that you may have. And just allowing these to arrive in the awareness of the heart center and paying particular attention to how it feels beyond just labeling it as gratitude, but how does it feel when you reflect on these positive things that are happening right now? feeling into any energy that this may have created into the heart center. Perhaps visualizing that feeling as an energy or a light. And as you inhale, maybe this light or energy becomes brighter, stronger. Noticing if there's a color or a texture to this energy. Every inhale, this sensation, this visual becoming stronger, clearer, brighter. And on the exhale, allowing it to begin filling the body. So breathing in, the light becomes stronger and breathing out, the energy starts moving out into the body. calling to mind these positive feelings that we may be experiencing right now as they fill the body and this universal trait that all beings in this universe share the desire to be happy and free from suffering and what does it feel like to reflect on this in the heart center how does this add or shift that energy knowing this trait of all beings And let's set a motivation for this practice to move into this direction, to support ourselves and others and the cultivation of what feels good and navigating through what might be difficult. Allowing whatever's happening in your experience in the heart center as this energy fills the body, let it be the engine of the boundless love any doubt, skepticism, let this energy just burn that up, perhaps using the visualization, or maybe it's just a knowing.
And as we continue breathing into and out of the heart center, calling to mind a loved one, perhaps a close friend or a teacher, maybe even a pet, but a being that is easy for you to love, that brings joy and a smile to your face. Imagining this being with you here now. and reflecting on how you truly wish the best for this person or this being. And as you inhale into this feeling in the heart center, on the exhale, beginning to expand from the heart, feeling this energy moving down the arms, out into the hands. And as you exhale, send this energy to your loved one. So inhaling, the heart becomes brighter. Exhaling, this energy moves out from the heart down to the hands and through to the loved one. If you'd like to work with phrases, perhaps offering some metta. May you be happy. May you be safe. May you be strong. Continuing to breathe into the heart center and on the exhale, extending this energy to your loved one. Perhaps even visualizing them receiving this energy if you're working with a visualization of light, perhaps seeing your loved one basking and glowing in this light from your heart center. And calling to mind that this being in front of you, just like you, also has difficulties and challenges in their life perhaps visualizing this area of suffering as an energy around them. And as you inhale, imagining that you're able to breathe this energy away from your loved one. And if it feels comfortable, inhaling that into your heart center. And as you exhale, transmuting it into your own love and light, extending back out to them. Inhaling their suffering, exhaling light from your heart center. If you like to work with wishes, perhaps on the inhale, may you be free. And on the exhale, offering for your loved one to be at peace. And noticing perhaps there may be a resistance to the idea of breathing in the suffering of another being. And remembering that you're breathing into the powerhouse of your love and compassion. So the suffering is the fuel for you to transmute and send metta, loving kindness. And if it's not comfortable to breathe in the suffering, perhaps you can See with your inhale, pulling it away from them and your exhale, replacing that with this energy of compassion and love. Taking a few moments here to rest in this cycle of extending and receiving, inhaling the energy of their suffering into your heart and exhaling out through your hands, metta and compassion.
And as we prepare to make a transition in this practice, perhaps inviting your loved one to remain with you, visualizing them sitting off to the side, supporting you. And taking a moment here to return to the breath, feeling into the heart center. Inhaling deeply into the heart. And on your next exhale, allowing that metta energy to flow out your arms, down into your hands. And now bringing your hands to your heart center and inhaling, receiving that energy of metta from your heart. Exhaling the metta out from your heart, down your arms, and inhaling, receiving it from the hands into your heart once again. Perhaps a visualization of creating an infinity loop, your heart at the center. Exhaling, expanding the energy of love and compassion out through your hands. Inhaling from your hands directly into your heart. Receiving your own love, your own kindness, your own care. Calling to mind where things may be difficult or challenging for you an aspect of life that may be unpleasant. And as you inhale this energy from your own hands, sending the metta to wherever it may be difficult right now, breathe it into your own suffering. Exhaling from the heart center, inhaling to the suffering. And we'll pause here to offer ourselves some wishes of self-compassion. We continue to rest with the breath or any visualization. Perhaps repeating these phrases silently in your mind. May I have all the courage I need in this moment. May I accept this moment exactly as it is. May I accept myself exactly as I am. May I be free from suffering. Perhaps visualizing as you inhale your own metta, the light from your heart center pulverizing your suffering. Every exhale sending this light from your heart center out Every inhale, receiving. And now filled with the energy of our own loving kindness and compassion, allowing the hands to return back to your side, either resting in your lap or on your thighs. Again, if it feels comfortable, keeping the palms facing up. Checking in with the breath one more time, breathing into the heart. And calling to mind now all those beings that may be struggling in the world, those that are sick, disease or injury, those beings that may be living with anxiety or depression. Seeing this energy rising up off of them. As you exhale, beginning to send the metta from your heart out to all of those that are suffering. And on the inhale, bringing the energy of their suffering into your heart center to be transmuted into metta. Exhaling and returning back out to all those that may be struggling right now.
And once again, resting here in this exchange, this extending outwards from the heart center and inhaling back in. Perhaps in the place of where these beings suffering was, replaced with the energy that you've been visualizing of your own loving kindness surrounding them. And from here, let's expand our awareness to all beings. The reminder of that one trait that we all wish to move towards happiness and away from suffering. Let's make this act of Tonglen in that honor. Exhaling, allowing the light to move outwards from your heart to all beings. If this may be overwhelming or difficult emotions are arising, knowing that you can always rest in the safe island of your breath. Remembering that this is a practice. And from here, dropping any visualization, allowing it to fade, dissolve, let go of any thought forms, thinking about the practice, analyzing, and just resting for a few moments here in an open awareness of what's alive. No longer a separation between the one extending and the one receiving, just being open, and awake. Taking one more breath together deeply into the heart center. And on the exhale, releasing the air, releasing the practice taking your time to return back to the place that we never left. If you had your eyes closed, allowing light to return once again into the awareness. So thank you all for that practice and your presence. So we wanna take some time uh, and, and ease into a transition, we know coming off of a practice like that it might still really be processing and feeling. So we have a few minutes that um, we can transition and open it up for any questions that may have arisen uh, in that, about that practice, uh, about Tonglen or anything that you'd like to share about your experience. And feel free to just drop that into the chat. <clears throat> <clears throat> As we're waiting to hear from folks in the chat around their practice, any any questions or reflections, um, always welcome. I was, um, yeah, just really noticing what a powerful practice of attention it is to do Tonglen and compassion. And I know that. I know that as a, a practitioner and a researcher that I can really find such vividness when I'm imagining someone else. And then things start to get a little less uh, tight and bright when it's just me. Um, that was a really, you know, then, then other ideas became far more appealing. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. 
And so Claudia is asking, um, hard time inhaling the suffering from others. And yeah, that's a very natural response. So there are a couple of different options. Um, you know, one could be that on the uh, inhale, it's like you're moving the suffering away from them, but maybe not bringing it all the way into your being if you're not feeling ready for that. And then as you exhale, where the space that you've created by moving that suffering away from them, then can be filled with this metta, this kindness from your heart. Um, and really just being careful to not force it if it's not feeling right, to breathe that in, to visualize that. Uh, you can um, rest with some of the wishes, you know, may you be free, uh, may you be at ease. So offering uh, those wishes. Um, the next question I see, you know, which also very understandable is um, overwhelmed thinking of all the suffering around us and the resistance for letting that all in. Mm. Uh, yeah, the, and so Mary Kay, the connection, uh, the hands over the heart, and definitely a lot of the, the self-touch is so important, you know, just even, even when we're not in a formal practice of just bringing the hands to the heart, maybe asking what do I need uh, in this moment, uh, maybe even some self-compassion of, you know, may I accept this moment is a really beautiful practice. Um, and... Gina and um, Sylvia, we will we'll be addressing this head on with Bodhicitta. So mm. hearing you loud and clear, and that's where we're headed. Uh, Tatiana felt like a distant healing, uh, energy healing session, sending love to the other person. Yeah, and especially in a time like this where we're physically separate from each other on a call like this, where we have people from all over the world that we can really cultivate this sense of connection which we're gonna talk about a little bit of like removing those barriers of what makes us feel so separate. Uh, so I'm glad that you found that, that supportive and that felt experience of uh, overcoming the distance. So thank you very much for everyone that offered uh, your questions. If anything comes up at any point during the session, please feel free to add it into the chat and we'll have some time at the end that Eve and I will be able to respond. So if you didn't get it in uh, now or something else comes up later, please feel free to add. So we're gonna transition uh, to talking about a little bit of what's behind Tonglen and what are we doing uh, here in this practice. Um, as many of you know, in the Eastern, in many of the Eastern traditions, the, um, the word for heart and mind are the same. So in Chinese, it's the same characters that are used to describe heart and mind. And in Sanskrit and in Pali, the word is chitta, uh, which means both heart and mind. Uh, and so it really brings into this idea, uh, like the emotive side of the mind rather than just the thinking, but also the feeling aspect of it. Uh, so you'll hear even I refer to this as the heart mind. Um, in the many references in the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the, in the Vajrayana Tantra teachings, um, it's actually the final stage of the process of death that the mind consciousness leaves the body through the heart chakra, which implies that it actually, the heart is the seat of the mind. Uh, so the idea is that at that moment, the, um, the knot of the heart chakra releases and opens, and this is what allows the consciousness to move forward. So there are some references of uh, supporting this idea that the mind and the heart are actually the same. And in the West, when you ask people to point to their mind, most of them are going to come here, point to their brain. And in a lot of these cultures that these wisdom traditions come from, and, and also to say this isn't just Buddhism, it's also, you know, in Hinduism, a lot of these traditions, this heart-mind idea is interlinked. Uh, and so they'll point, when you ask, where's the mind, they'll point to their heart. Um, 
So I think that, you know, as we mentioned in the beginning of this, a lot of the work here is about looking at how we're identifying. And so if we're identifying our mind with our thoughts, um, it can be really limiting. Uh, that it would be like identifying our mind with another sense. So uh, this idea of bringing it into the heart center and out of the receiver of the brain opens up a lot of space. Um, and as I said, what I really love about this idea of the heart mind is that then the mind can be associated with more feeling than it is about thinking. And in thinking where we have dualism of the dualistic thought, which Eve is gonna talk a little bit more about later, um, our, it's our thinking that separates things into subjects, objects, this and that, and it actually is what causes us to feel separate. So uh, reflecting in this way that the, that the mind is resting in the heart from a felt experience brings us closer into touching into that non-dual aspect that Eve will talk a little bit more about. Um, and so ultimately the reason that I'm, you know, reflecting on this is because this is what leads us to bodhicitta, bodhicitta, the awakened heart mind, uh, bodhi meaning awaken, citta meaning heart mind. So the sense of a, a lack of separation uh, is what really arouses this selflessness. Mm. As I was saying to Eve earlier, when I was younger, I always used to think of selflessness as a character trait, like kindness. And it wasn't really until I came to the Dharma that I saw and, and started diving into the concepts of no self that I, it clicked. I was like, oh, right, there's no separate self here. I'm selfless. So it behooves me to act in a way as if I am, you know, you are me and I am you. Uh, and so this is the awakened mind um, and where we can really generate the uh, metta, the compassion, the equanimity, all from this sense of the awakened mind. And one last aspect um, before we move into a reflection, uh, this idea that uh, in the English language, heart and mind come across as nouns. But really the invitation here is to consider them both as a noun and a verb. So it's a process, it's in movement. It's not a hard, steady, independent, fixed thing. Um, and so that means that we can uh, simultaneously be both being and doing. It's an inherent coupling of the heart-mind to be both a thing and a process. Uh, and so that brings us to uh, a reflection question. Uh, Rinpoche in, uh, in the book, Open, Open Heart, Open Mind, he invites us to look at our life, to look at uh, how we define ourselves and how, what we're capable of. So with that in mind, I'd like to um, propose this question. If you know, these practices are a mirror of our Dharma practice, um, we might see how we are clinging or where there might be aversion where there might be self-cherishing that we're holding on to. Uh, so the question to reflect for a few moments, and if it feels comfortable, you can close your eyes and just reflect quietly in your mind. And what have you learned from looking in this mirror about your own practice of compassion, perhaps where the veil of separation may be strong? But what comes up for you when you think about this practice as a mirror? And what is it showing you? And just taking time to let whatever arises come into your awareness, maybe difficult, maybe more supportive, just being open and welcoming whatever arises here. And if you'd like, again, with the invitation here is to perhaps add into the chat and share uh, what may be coming up for you as you reflect on where your own practice of compassion is, where you might still feel, uh, as we all do, very separate. 
many of you have heard me before say like we have these senses that tell us that we're separate i i can literally feel separate from you i can see that i'm separate from you so uh this this practice gives us the mirror to see where we might still be uh really feeling and in uh identifying with that separation rather than the opportunity that we're presented with to see our interconnectedness here So if there's anything that's really calling out to be shared, uh, please feel free to add that in the chat. Hmm. Sandra says she feels even more separate now with the masks and the, and the distance and this, um, but also a strange sense of connection. Mm. And Sammy says, I can feel compassion for others, but find it hard to believe that others feel compassion for me. Mm. How many people can relate to that one? I would put two hands up. Ah, yeah. Clarification question there. When you say this practice, do you mean Tonglen? Mm -hmm. Really, you know, any, any Dharma practice can be a mirror for us to see, you know, where our attachments and aversions are. Um, so, you know, feel free to answer that however you like, uh, you know, in the context of, yes, of, of this Tonglen practice. But, you know, we've been weaving in a lot of awareness, metta, compassion. So however um, hmm. you've seen in that mirror. These two beautiful questions very much um, on the emotional balance side. One around um, from Keith needing to move through sadness before a feeling of loving kindness because Keith doesn't know when they'll see their uh, niece again. So um, that separateness, that actual separateness feels so painful. Mm. And then this uh, seeing frustration and anger as suffering is a way to connect with compassion. Um, Gina and Sylvia say, I think it's it's very common for us to not see anger as a as an actual form of suffering that is hard for us. So that's a beautiful insight. Mm. I'm really appreciating the vulnerability and the openness that's being um, shown here in the chats. Mm. And it really, you know, goes to show that this is difficult, and that's why we do practice. Mm -hmm. And Noam is saying that sometimes kindness seems transactional. Mm. And when I realize I can try to drop it and it clarifies that I'm not separate or any other feeling. Mm. I think I've mentioned before that I had this big aha about the transactional nature of my metta that was very upsetting. It made me feel like I had these years of practice where I was, it was really like, I'm going to, I'm going to do it for them and it's separate from me, but it makes me feel good. And, um, that is a real um, trap we can fall into, unfortunately. And I think that really speaks to um, the patterns, you know, identifying as that pattern. Like that may be here and that may be what's alive in our practice, but we don't have to identify that way. Mm. And really, you know, remembering the, the true nature, of the Buddha nature that's inside of all of us, this unlimited potential that we have is here at all times, even if we're not feeling it, it's here. Mm -hmm. And Donna says, uh, when I feel separate from myself, this, the practice helps me recognize that my thoughts are not often helpful. I've been finding that uh, I'm allowing myself to go with the impulse to give myself and others um, to give to myself and others when I get the idea. It's a great idea. Yeah, just like letting it flow whenever it's natural. Some synchronicity there with Annette, her partner calling her during the meditation. <laughs> calling it in, literally. <laughs> 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 
So thank you again to everyone for sharing. Um, really beautiful. Um, I'll transition to this next part of teaching that we are sharing with you all on Bodhicitta with a beautiful quote by Sukhni here, where he's really trying to unpack what is the felt experience of our Bodhicitta? What is it like? And he says, sometimes cradling my daughters, feeding them or changing their diapers wasn't enough to stop their crying, but I did my best verbally repeating soothing mantras um, non-verbally holding them, rocking them, and all the f physical actions to alleviate their distress. To me, this is the real meaning of bodhicitta, waking to a cry in the darkness and responding to the best of our abilities. The only difference is that in the case of bodhicitta, we ourselves are often the ones crying in the dark. Unfortunately, we tend to sleep through the conflicts we face in our lives. We ignore our Buddha moments and don't let them awaken our hearts. We fail to see that recognizing, admitting, and clearly understanding the patterns we experience in our own lives can have transformative effect on the way we function in the world and the way we relate to others. Pretty much says it all. <laughs> I really love him highlighting here that, that felt experience, and I know I've mentioned this before, of that call to compassion, to be that tender as waking to the crying child in the night. And especially that young child who can't even tell you what's wrong. And the kind of caring and that embodied holding. Um, and as Tig led us through, we did that to ourselves. What we would extend to other, what does it feel like to directly place our own hands on our hearts? And I think for those of us for whom this practice still feels remote and challenging, to apply bodhicitta to our own suffering, to our own totally tiresome habits and patterns that we feel we always get caught in. Can we apply it right there? And so when we have this invitation to feel it directly, to notice what it's like to feel our own suffering in the moment, I think we have a lot of opportunity. Because that felt experience, it might be more powerful than our mind. Our mind might say, you know, you lose your temper all the time with this specific loved one. Like you really should be over this by now. Like, I know it felt bad, but come on, like, what are you doing here? But if we can just respond without that narrative, but just with that felt feelingness of holding, that's a really beautiful direct experience of bodhicitta, holding ourselves in the night like the crying child. And this idea that we ignore our Buddha moments and don't let them awaken our hearts. So not only are we being harsh on ourselves, which obviously is not great, we're also missing out on the opportunity for transformation. And maybe we think we're tired of this specific opportunity for transformation and growth, but that's the one you got. So that's what we get to work with. So I want to talk a little bit um, and help us parse out different aspects of bodhicitta. Um, again, everything he is saying in this chapter, I have learned many times. I've actually learned it from him many times, and yet still really integrating it at just the simplest level has really enlivened my practice. So one aspect he talks about is this idea of absolute and relative bodhicitta. Can I see a raise of hands? Who has heard these terms absolute and relative before? Yeah, it, it's pretty common. And I think what's really meaningful about looking at these distinctions is it helps us understand what we could um, kind of set our sights towards in the future and what we can hold ourselves to here every day. I think when we hear absolute, it's almost like it flies right over our head. It seems so unfathomable. It's like a, a really nice idea, like having a, um, a swimming pool in your backyard. Maybe some of you do. And it's like, oh, that sounds great. It's never gonna happen. I live in an apartment building and there's, you know, there's no backyard, right? It seems just completely out of the realm of possibility. And yet it does offer us this almost like a gymnasium of possibility, of intention, of motivation. So the way that Sokni describes this absolute, <laughs> get ready, recognize that you may not be there yet, but try to just open and soften your heart to this possibility, that 
this absolute bodhicitta could be possible for you. A person who has attained absolute bodhicitta sees everyone deep in their natures as fully awakened beings and quite naturally treats them with deep respect. Within absolute bodhicitta or the absolutely awakened heart, there is no distinction between subject and object, self and other. All sentient beings are spontaneously recognized as perfect manifestations of basic nature. So beautiful. So beautiful. And maybe some of us have had a glimpse of that, where we really feel at peace with others, where we feel deeply connected to others, where we recognize that all of us have this innate spark, have this emptiness, this clarity, and this love as part of who we are. And probably for most of us, it doesn't last that long. Um, and yet, even getting a tiny glimpse of that and the freedom it provides, so inspiring. It is so inspiring. Of course, it would be of great benefit for us. Imagine having no feelings of blame, no feelings of judgment, no feelings of frustration, right? There was a sense of being totally connected. But the entry toll is high. We have to let everybody into our heart as though they were us, as though we are one. And that's hard, right? In the chat, you know, we heard from Gina and Sylvia saying, letting everybody in, <laughs> that is overwhelming. And I think in some ways our our edging into letting everybody in, it has to really be based on A, a deep yearning of our bodhicitta, wanting to feel that goodness of pure interconnection. And B, kind of waking up to the fact that we already are letting in all that suffering. I have had many times in my life where I tried to keep the suffering of my family at an arm's distance. Can anybody relate to that? Yeah, wouldn't that be nice if it worked? Does it actually work? No, it's still there. Maybe it's not like up in your face or you're, you're getting some distance, but it's already there. It's already there. Those barriers and walls you put up, they don't actually keep out the suffering of others. Now, I'm not saying that reducing the amount of direct exposure to people who are immediately harmful to you is not good. That is very good but to hold them out of your heart, it doesn't actually work. Um, obviously, it's not great for them, but I just, you know, I invite you to consider, does it actually work for you? And so instead of looking at aspirational, um, or sorry, <laughs> uh, absolute uh, bodhicitta as this thing that won't happen, this imaginary amazing thing, maybe looking at it as, how much more truth do we need to see to realize it's the only sane option? And this is something, you know, Tig and I both work in healthcare um, in that we are right now having the opportunity to be of service to healthcare providers and share these compassion teachings. And it's really hard to teach compassion when you're truly caring about others and giving yourself um, you know, your time, your effort, your heart, and your intention without being able to break down these barriers, without it having be, without it being about what I can do to help you and whether you're going to be okay and whether I'm doing enough. That, that actual subject object actually is more exhausting for our compassion. And yet, unless you have decided to become a practitioner, that would be a hard sell. It's hard to say, you know what would really help your feelings of burnout and empathic distress, have more compassion, feel yourself as exactly equal to others. <laughs> um, so I know it's a hard sell. I know it's a hard sell. And yet I, I really invite you to keep that aspiration. And that aspiration, as, as Tig led us through, that is in our practice. So we, again, we use our practice as our laboratory, our time for opportunity of experimenting. I'm gonna hold absolute bodhicitta in the beginning of every practice. I'm gonna dedicate my practice with absolute bodhicitta, right? Because that's, we can do that. We can totally do that and really start to get that heartfelt sense. So relative bodhicitta, 
on the other hand, is it involves sincerely dedicating ourselves towards helping all sentient beings to become completely free of suffering through recognizing their true nature. This effort is referred to as relative because it's still grounded in a dualistic perception of reality in which subjects and objects, selves and others, as well as various characteristics of experience such as good and bad, pleasant and unpleasant, are defined and experienced in relationship to one another. So our relative bodhicitta, it's how we show up when we can have generosity and kindness and be compassionate, and it is good. There is, I am not dissing relative bodhicitta at all. I think all of us would love to increase our relative bodhicitta, our natural feeling of an awakened heart to the suffering of all. So many of you sit with Chandra when uh, she's here um, with me and on her own, and you may remember that almost every single time she begins a meditation, she says, arouse bodhicitta, arouse bodhicitta. Arouse the heart of awakened um, presence that can really take into account the suffering of all beings. And then this idea of, okay, I have the absolute in mind, and the relative is what I'll work on on a day-to-day -day basis. The absolute will be in mind in my practice, in my place where I can really explore. And then on the day-to-day, -day, I will continue enacting my compassion in a way that, that is supportive, that is important. And yeah, in which there is a separation between myself and the person I'm having compassion to. So that's one aspect. The second aspect I, I wanna share with you is on the aspiration and application of bodhicitta. So I, I kind of already mentioned this, but with bodhicitta, we can have it really exist and kind of infuse our life through our aspiration. So that essentially is just the way that we uh, set our intention as we did today in the beginning. And TIG offered such a really interesting opportunity for us to consider our motivation and our int intention and our goals. Um, and I might have to ask him to walk us through that one more time, because I think the more specific we can get, the better. The more specific we can get. So it might be that if our, our true aspiration, our true motivation is always to be of service to all beings and to relieve suffering, that might mean that how we go about it on a day-to-day -day basis might look different. It might look different if that is always our aspiration that never wavers. But today, I have to be on WebEx meetings for seven hours. But tomorrow, I'm actually going to work at the food bank or volunteer at the food bank. That might mean we have a different intention with how we can show up, how we can enact and make that bodhicitta real. So the aspiration is this kind of, um, I don't know the exact right word. It's really, um, imagine it as though it were infusing every single cell in your body. And then the application is when actually the world rises up with an opportunity so that you can enact. So we always want to be training in this bodhicitta so that when there's an opportunity for us to help, we're ready. The opportunities are not always there. There's not always an easy way for us to respond to the suffering that's around us at all times. The suffering might be too great. It might be too remote. Uh, we might not have resources at that moment to show up. And so this idea of application, it's really, it's really skillful, you know, that we have these two aspiration application as separate so that we don't wear ourselves out thinking we have to do everything for everyone. I bet everyone here has tried that at least once, right? I'm gonna, my compassion means that I wanna really be of service to absolutely everyone I can at all times. And then you burn out in like maybe a month, maybe a week. So how do we have this idea of holding that my aspiration is unwavering? I am always keeping in mind this aspiration. But when I get to apply it, okay, it's not always there. Okay, here I can apply it. Here's something I can actually do. Wonderful. So I think that's a really, um, a really useful way. And so how do we keep this aspiration in mind? How do we keep this intention of an awakened heart, a heart that is ready to meet the suffering of the world? How do we keep it in mind? 
And Tig and I were speaking about how we could start associating our intention with something in the body. So Tig for the last, gosh, probably more than a year has been drawing on his hand. Can we see it? Can you show it to us? It's, tonight's just a simple one. Just a heart. Sometimes it's a beautiful mandala. And that is how he sets and reminds himself of that intention and aspiration on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I wanna invite us for a moment to, if you can close your eyes, great. And find a place where you can land your aspiration. And it's helpful if this could be somewhere in the body, on the front of your body, somewhere you can see easily. It could be something simple like, I am deciding that it's my right thumb. Every time I see my right thumb, I really evoke the sense and deep feeling of my dedication to bodhicitta. So choose somewhere in the body that feels right. Somewhere you want to try just for the next week. Every time I see this part of my body, I feel into this part of my body, I'm going to associate this awakened heart, remembering, waking up to who I truly am. And who I truly am is a being capable of boundless love. So finding, and imagine as though you were burying a hidden treasure there. And prospectively setting an intention to really remember, keep fresh in mind this aspiration. Every time you see that part of your body, every time you use that part of your body, And gently wiggling our fingers and toes and blinking our eyes back together. So happily, we wanted to save some time here for good discussion and reflections from folks. Um, I, I see, aha, Tig shared his goal, motivation, intention. Tig, would you mind just walking us through that one more time? And um, other folks, please uh, feel free to put in questions and we will start answering them and engage in discussion. Yeah, so um, this is something that I, that it's been really helpful for me to, because these words have become so cliched, especially intention uh, of like really getting clear on, um, on these three different aspects. So go, knowing what it is that we want, the aspiration, that's the goal. It's measurable, we can follow up on it. And then it's so important to understand what is our motivation. And it's very surprising sometimes when we look at this, we realize that sometimes our motivation and our goal are not aligned. So it's a really good exercise to just tick through these, uh, the why behind the what, and then finally the intention, like. What's the attitude that we wish to embody as we navigate towards that goal? And it's less about following up or measuring it. It's more of like setting the course. Uh, I like to talk a lot about vibration. So it's like the vibe that we want to have as we move towards our aspirations. So wonderful. And, you know, we can do this. We can do this all the time. Right? There's, there's absolutely no need for us to do this only when we sit. We can consider that um, throughout our day. Um, some really nice uh, reflections here. So Claudia is saying that she sees herself as impatient and emotionally numb towards loved ones. Um, and it reminds her, this talk and, and practice, that we need the self-compassion um, as well as towards ourself. And then it says Lonnie Potts, but my guess is it's actually Stan, because that's who I see. Um, has written here, um, relative bodhicitta sets up an interesting dynamic tension. When directed outward towards others, it cultivates a sense of urgency to achieving awakening 
to most effectively alleviate the suffering of others. Directed inward, it helps cultivate a sense of patience with our flawed and halting progress towards that awakening. So he's really showing here that it can give us urgency and patience. So urgency for others and patience with ourselves. Thank you, Stan. That's a beautiful reflection. Hmm. Um, question here, I'm confused by the talk of separateness, yet holding that with the ideal when we're all connected on a very fundamental level. Me too, it's confusing. It's this whole separateness thing is totally confusing. Um, Tig, I loved what you were saying around this idea of through my senses, I feel I'm separate. And yet that's only one part of our beingness, but we identify with it so strongly. And yeah. I, I and that's the, that's the relative part, you know, like that's how we're relating based on our sensory experience that we can't, we can't, we literally don't, we can't feel the connection. Mm. So it, it is limiting. And I think Christopher, your question is, you know, spot on that the, these two things, one, one, the, uh, the fundamental level that we're all connected, that's ultimate bodhicitta. And to like really be like, take a, a moment to relieve ourselves of striving to feel that right now. And that mm -hmm. opens the door then for the relative, the felt experience. As I said to Eve, you know, the way that I like to think of it is like, well, there is this ultimate truth of oneness, no self, selflessness. And in the meantime, while we <laughs> wait to become enlightened, <laughs> that we have these relative practices to help us cultivate and that that ultimate nature arises from the practice in the relative dimension and i think i i love i love that and i think um you know the the quote that i shared for um for this session tonight or that that really seemed to sum to sum up uh, what it means to wake up to bodhicitta is saying essentially that we, we just get really confused about who we are. We get over identified in this self and then we get, we get lost to this more ultimate reality. And there are some um, of the translations of what mindfulness is, is remembering, keeping in mind. We remember our bodhicitta and as we remember it and we remember it and remember it, it starts to become more fluidly part of how we understand ourselves and others. My guess is it's always been hard, but in our contemporary modern world, it's especially hard to remember our connectivity. We, we live in very disconnected times. Um, so there's a, what a, I would say a beautiful question. Um, can you explain what Metta is? Really appreciate that question. And, Tig and I were speaking before the session, in some traditions, metta, loving kindness, and karuna, compassion, are, are really just kind of interchanged um, and not separated. That is, um, I, I don't think that's a problem per se, but I think it's really nice to have precision between the two. I think there's a lot of different ways to, to describe the difference. For me, it's really helpful to think of when I'm cultivating this genuine feeling for myself of what does it mean to be happy? What are the aspirations, motivations, and intentions that support that? And also how that, so that would be metta, that would be loving kindness. And then with um, karuna or with compassion, how can I alleviate the suffering I experience? That's different, that's different. And I think when we just kind of meld them together without a clear understanding internally, we miss out a little bit on both. I'd really love to hear what you think on that. Thing. I, I mean, I, with metta as, as a definition for me about, you know, it's the wish, it's, it's the wish for another to be happy. And so much of our culture love is defined as uh, I love you because you make me feel good. It's hedonic. And uh, metta is more eudaimonic, where it comes from within. I, I want you to be happy, and that's why I love you. Uh, it's hard. Like, it's, that, it's a lot easier to say that than it is to actually practice it, but I think that's why we're all here. And also, you know, as Eve was mentioning, the delineation between metta and karuna with compassion. And I think 
what's really important for me in that aspect is with compassion that we don't know what it's like for others to suffer, but we mm. do know what it's like for us to suffer. So that I want to be free from my suffering. And so then I can relate to all of you because I know you want to be free from your suffering. I don't need to get down there in the hole with you and suffer the way that you are. That's not helpful to anyone. Um, but the, the separating out uh, an outbound wish for happiness versus a aspiration to be free from suffering, uh, it's, for me personally, has been really helpful in my own relationships. And um, yeah, I could go on, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm really loving these questions. Um, Cassandra says, I'm going to be honest. Sometimes I really feel like my true nature is aversive, impatient, and irritable. I hear that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I have a different flavor. Mine would be anxious <laughs> and worried. Um, and yeah, that we have this idea proposed to us that our true nature is clarity, emptiness, and love. It's hard to believe. It can be hard to believe. It can be very counter to what we, you know, what we focus on, um, what we've seen prioritized, what we haven't seen kind of cultivated and understood. And this is new vocabulary for us. It's almost as though we didn't know where to look for it. So how could we know it's there? And so I would just say that, you know, most of us have been aware of the things about ourselves we don't like for as early as we can remember. I mean, I bet if I could really focus right now on what is my first memory, it's probably something that was hard, not something that was great about myself. So I think giving ourselves that um, kind of healthy and grounded understanding that at our most basic evolutionary predispositions, there is a focus on what's hard. Remembering what's hard and difficult, remembering what we'd like to improve, it can function our progress and understanding. Most of us are way overdeveloped in that department. And it can actually get in the way of our ability to see ourselves in connection to others. One of the hardest parts about that feeling of, I actually identify strongly with being frustrated or being anxious or being deficient, um, it closes us off to empathy, mm. creates self-related concern. So even if you're like, you know what, Eve, I don't believe you <laughs> that I am naturally capable of bodhicitta, but I want to be more available to others. So I guess I'll let that go for a while. So whatever works for you in terms of letting go a bit of that limited view of self, go for it. Go for it. So it's almost you're using bodhicitta as a backdoor into being an okay person. Um, wonderful. Um, Another great question I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to, to um, respond to is, I understand shitta pretty well, but can you take a bit more time about the word bodhi? Uh, it is said so much and used in so many words and phrases. I'd love a back to basics definition um, and, and, and some words about it outside the definition of awakened. <laughs> mm. I think to start off by saying like language will fail us here because Bodhi is the ultimate nature of reality. It is the awakened mind that can see these things that we've been talking about at the ultimate level. So it's, I'm already going to fail by using words to try and articulate this, but <laughs> uh, you know, I think it is the, the true nature of reality. It's our awareness. It's the awakeness. I know awake is the cliche that we're trying to avoid here, but like, you know, as we were talking about before, noticing where our patterns and how we identify with them. And even as Cassandra was saying, like there's a bit of a identification as, as the true nature being this way, when really our true nature is the awareness of our experience. So we could, we could navigate this entire lifetime with these destructive emotions, with these difficulties, but at the end of the day, Bodhi is our awakeness, our awareness of it. Mm -hmm and identifying more as that, the awareness of it, rather than the object that we're observing. Uh, I, even there saying that, that's ultimately not even correct because there wouldn't be an object to observe in the awakening. <laughs> <laughs> no. hmm. yeah. hmm. That was so beautiful, wow. Um, I'm really loving these questions, these like so-called simple, but deeply profound questions on what are these words we're using? How are we trying to elucidate um, what 
ultimately and relatively we have to experience we have to feel yeah beautiful um seeing if there's one more here uh just a reflection from tatiana being dependent on others was the most heart opening practice for me yeah i can imagine um having been dependent on others when I've been pretty ill or otherwise, it's really, that really does help us remember this, this deep interdependence that we have and that we share. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, for me, it, it brings up the, uh, the teaching around interbeing, you know, taking that one step down a, a further uh, of that everything is a part of us and we are a part of everything. Uh, so that in, independence is uh, getting us closer to that, that true nature. So maybe we take a moment here to come back. We started with intention and aspiration. We've explored what that intention and aspiration of bodhicitta is. So let's, let's come home right into it. So I invite you to gently close your eyes if that's comfortable. And see if you can feel the imprint of where your palms were placed on your chest. Where that sense of deep caring for the self was made manifest. Can we awaken to our own suffering and find right in that same instant that we have everything we need? And consider for a moment this outrageous and yet beautiful aspiration of absolute bodhicitta. May we find all beings just like us as entirely deserving of love, as already perfect, as natural manifestations of a true and basic nature of goodness. And may all of us find our way there, find our way home, pulling back all the veils of separation between ourselves and this ultimate nature of our awakened heart. May we all experience that profound, limitless connection here and now and in the future. And before we come back together, taking a moment to remind yourself where in the body you're landing this aspiration. And keep close to it for the next couple days. See what it's like to really refresh and remind yourself of this arousing of bodhicitta. Each time fresh and new. And then gently wiggling our fingers and toes and blinking our eyes back into our shared space. Tig, thank you for your teaching and your presence with us tonight. Really, really wonderful to be together. Yeah, and thank you all for sharing your presence and your heart. Um, I know we're going to have announcements in just a moment here. I'd love it if folks could just unmute um, and say, hello, hi, I love you. Hi, Eve, thank you. Thank you, T. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Really great meeting. Mm.
Thank you. And Mace, I stole your thunder here, but I know there's some announcements, so please. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Mace, and I'm just, it's just so lovely to be with everyone in this particularly strange and difficult time. And, <laughs> um, I, you know, it really is. It's different from all the work Zooms. I put, we put in the chat box a couple of times um, the donation link for the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And um, I think what I really just want to say about donating to keep this scene running and to help um, support our teachers is, is that this pandemic has helped me really see, um, it's highlighted deeply the disparities that already existed. And it's also highlighted deeply what's important. And so, you know, I'm, I feel like things that I thought were really important before are not important anymore. Um, and things that I, I was less aware are important have become really important. The beautiful thing for me is that the Dharma has been a through line for that, but like it is really critical, like Eve said mm. at the beginning, um, because without it, for me, is despair. And that's not an option right now because um, that's, I mean, it happens from time to time, but so, so hoping that folks can give generously supporting our teachers is a really profound act right now, kind of radical. And also the collective is really aware that a lot of people can't do that. So we're, these are different times, things are tight. Um, so donate what you can. And then the cool thing you can do is look on the Dharma Collective calendar and there's all kinds of great stuff coming up. Saturday, Mary Stan Cabbage, who is down in LA, who's just like an old teacher from the ATS days and really full of, um, really full of bodhicitta is teaching. I believe it's a half day. And amazing. Just, like, yeah, stuff going on all the time. So check it out. It's really awesome. Um, Katie's reminding you guys that it's always at this link. You can go to the Dharma Collective website and get the link and the password. So big love to everybody in this beautiful community thank you all <laughs>